Although at first glance, Dorothea Puente might appear to be a sweet, kind grandma, but appearances are sometimes misleading. In reality, Puente was a serial murderer who killed at least nine people in her Sacramento boarding house through the 1980s. Nothing would have alerted the elderly and disabled residents of Dorothea Puente's home of the kind of house they had been unfortunate enough to live in. All of them were completely unaware that between 1982 and 1988, she had been poisoning and strangling some of her boarders before burying them on her property and cashing in their social security checks. The disappearance of these so-called shadow people went unreported for many years. The first of multiple deaths was ultimately discovered when police, looking for a missing tenant, noticed a disturbing area of ground next to Puente's boarding house. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we take a look at this scary journey into this haunted house haunted by its landlady. Fasten your seatbelts because this story is sure to blow you away. On January 9th, 1929, in Redlands, California, Dorothea Helen Gray, later known as Dorothea Puente, was born in less than ideal living conditions. Despite being the sixth of seven children, she did not have a secure upbringing. When Puente was eight years old, her father, an alcoholic, cotton picker, passed away from tuberculosis. Her mother, an alcoholic who often beat her kids, passed away in a motorbike accident a year later. Later in life, she made up information about her upbringing, claiming that she was one of three kids Kids born and raised in Mexico. Puente and her siblings were abandoned and dispersed, living in foster care and with family members. When she was 16 years old, Puente left home. She tried becoming a prostitute in Olympia, Washington, but that didn't work out so well. Instead, Puente got married. She tied the knot for the first time at age 16 in 1945 with a soldier named Fred McFall, who had recently returned from the Pacific Theater. Between 1946 and 1948, Dorothea gave birth to two girls, but she gave one away for adoption and sent the other to her relatives in Sacramento. In 1948, Dorothea conceived again, but the pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. McFall deserted her in late 1948. Dorothea would come to hate this and later say that her spouse passed away from a heart attack just days after they married, feeling humiliated at being abandoned. Moving on, she attempted to falsify checks but was ultimately discovered and given a year in prison. She was released on parole after six months and became pregnant again for a guy she hardly knew. She she gave birth to a daughter and then put her up for adoption months after her release from prison. She followed this up with a troubled 14-year marriage to a Swede called Axel Johansson, whom she married in 1952. However, Puente's erratic behavior appeared to follow her everywhere she went, and the new couple constantly quarreled about Puente's binge drinking and gambling, among other things. She showed several disturbing behaviors, and when he couldn't tolerate it anymore, Puente's husband sent her to a mental hospital after she offered to engage in sexual activity with an undercover police officer in a red light spot. Their union survived despite this until 1966. She was detained for running a brothel in 1960 and given a 90-day jail sentence in Sacramento County. Following her release, she was caught once more, this time for vagrancy and given a second 90-day prison term. She started a criminal career after that, one that grew more serious over time. Puente's next two marriages would be short-lived. In 1968, she she hitched to Roberto Puente. However, they split up 60 months later. Puente subsequently married Pedro Angel Montavo, but he divorced her just a week after. Dorothea Puente felt that she was a capable caregiver, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. She established her first boarding home in Sacramento in the late 1970s. She obtained employment as a nurse's assistant, looking after elderly and disabled individuals in private homes. She quickly began to oversee boarding houses. After a brief marriage, Puente began to spend time at a neighborhood pub hunting for older guys who were getting benefits. She stole their money by forging their signatures, but she was ultimately apprehended and charged with 34 counts of treasury fraud. She carried out the same deception even though she was on probation. Records from the California Court of Appeal show Puente started renting an upper unit at 1426 F Street in downtown Sacramento in 1981. 
In the 1970s, social workers were inspired by Dorothea Puente and her boarding home. Puente had a reputation for accepting difficult cases, including elderly individuals, drug users, recovering alcoholics, and persons with mental illnesses. However, Puente was only doing this because she had come up with a sinister roadmap littered with dead bodies and blood. However, she would have to wait, as her time as a caregiver would be short-lived. After getting caught signing her name on tenants' benefit checks, she lost her first boarding home. Puente was imprisoned for her thefts in 1982. Three years later, she was freed despite a state psychologist's assessment that she was psychotic, without remorse or sorrow, and needed to be closely watched. Puente instead started a second boarding house. She rapidly reverted to her old ways there. This time, Puente took in shadow people, or those who were barely housed and had no close relatives or friends, and before long, they started to vanish. Puente was so organized that no one else noticed the heinous crime she was committing with her sweet little hands and cute looking house. Puente's justification that the persons residing at her home were visitors or friends rather than boarders was accepted even by the probation officers who dropped by from time to time. Puente was diagnosed with chronic, undifferentiated schizophrenia, a disorder that can occasionally result in delusions. Her passion for acting is remembered by her neighbors, who also recall her boasting of fictitious, leading parts as the bad lady in several feature films. Puente advertised herself as a holy doctor on the side, but after 1978, her primary source of income was running a boarding home in Sacramento, California. In 1982, Puente was found guilty of drugging and robbing individuals she encountered in several bars. After serving two and a half years in jail, she was allowed to return to her rooming house. She worked in the garden for hours daily, and the neighbors said she was extremely possessive of her grass. She would use words that would make a sailor blush if anyone strolled on her property. One person told reporters, one of Dorothea's first targets was Ruth Monroe. 61 at the time, Ruth moved in to Dorothea Puente's home in April 1982. Shortly after Monroe passed away from an overdose, Puente informed the responding officers that Monroe had been sad due to her husband's prognosis. The officials declared Monroe's death a suicide and then left satisfied. However, a month later, Puente was detained and accused of drugging four senior citizens and taking their property. One of the victims, a 74-year-old man, told the Sacramento Bee that Puente drugged him before robbing him and stealing his possessions as he stood there motionless and speechless. Puente was given a five year prison term at the California Institution for Women at Frontiera by a court. After three years in 1985, she was allowed to go with the conditions that she did not approach the elderly and not handle any government checks of any type issued to anyone. Dorothea Puente hired Ismail Flores in November 1985 to install wood paneling in her house. Puente wanted Flores to build her a six foot long box, which she could then fill a few books and a few other miscellaneous objects before the two of them took the box to a storage facility. However, Puente unexpectedly instructed Flores to stop close to a riverbank and toss the box into the water on the route to the storage facility. A fisherman discovered the box on New Year's Day. He thought it strangely resembled a coffin and called the authorities. Investigators quickly discovered an older man's rotting body inside. Authorities wouldn't be able to identify the body as one of Dorothea Puente's tenants for more than three years. Suspicions about Puente didn't start to surface until 1988, when 52-year-old Alvaro Montoya, one of her tenants, went missing. Montoya had a history of mental illness and had been living on the streets for many years. Because Dorothea Dorothea Puente had a stellar reputation for accepting guests like him, he had been recommended to visit her home. Unlike others who walked through Puente's boarding home, Montoya was the target of someone's attention. When Montoya disappeared, Judy Moyce, an outreach counselor with Volunteers of America, developed suspicions. She also didn't believe Puente's justification that he was on vacation. Moyce called the police, and they were at the boarding house in no time. However, Dorothea Puente approached them and reiterated her claim that Montoya was only on vacation. John Sharp, a different tenant, supported her. According to media reports, John Sharp, 64, a retired cook who resided in the boarding house for 11 months before the police closed it down, said Puente had a kind side. She fed stray cats, gave her boarders clothes and cigarettes, and even bought one disabled tenant an adult tricycle so he could be mobile. 
As the police were about to leave, an unexpected twist happened. As if possessed by a spirit, Sharp summoned courage and told officers that Dorothea was forcing him to lie. <clears throat> Returning, the cops searched every inch of the residence. They requested permission to dig up the yard after finding nothing, and to the tenant's surprise, Dorothea allowed them to do so. Puente said she even gave them an additional shovel. She then inquired whether going to purchase a coffee would be okay. Yes, the officers said, and then they dug. Leono Carpenter was discovered by the police together with six more dead bodies in Dorothea's boarding house. To escape, Dorothea Puente went to Los Angeles. There, she was missing for five days. But after a man at a pub recognized her on TV, he called the cops. In a matter of hours, Puente was taken to the airport, boarded a Lear aircraft that KCRA TV and the Sacramento Bee had specifically hired for the trip and flown back to Sacramento. After she was arrested, the Sacramento County Jail discovered that among her belongings was an envelope containing $3,042. Later that morning, she was escorted into court, where she had a meeting with Peter Vlatin and Kevin Climo, her two court-appointed counsel. She was charged with murdering Montoya on one count and was refused bail seven minutes later. The police continued the process of identifying corpses and processing evidence as Puente lingered in jail. The prosecution was finally prepared after months of work, and on April 25th, 1990, the pre-trial hearing started. The Sacramento courthouse was packed with media and speculators for one of the most fascinating cases in the state's history. The prosecution team presented their evidence in front of Judge Gail H. O'Hanagan, intending to present Dorothea Puente as a cold-blooded assassin who opened a boarding home only to kill her guests so that she could claim their legal advantages as her own. The defense retaliated, claiming that Puente's right to a fair trial was in jeopardy, since the trial had turned into a public spectacle. Based on the same argument, they requested a different location. Judge O'Hanagan calmly listened to both sides' arguments over the two days of subsequent court proceedings. The judge finally made her decision after hearing all the arguments. She could not uncover proof that the trial violated Puente's constitutional rights to a fair trial and would go as scheduled, despite being exceptional in its coverage and resulting public attention. The prosecution produced many witnesses over the next few days who gave damaging testimony to back up their case. In response, the defense attempted to show their client was a victim of circumstance by claiming that the alleged victims had all passed away naturally and that Puente had buried them under the garden out of fear that she may be held accountable because they passed away while in her care. They gathered a group of witnesses who could attest to Puente's generosity and good deeds to help them make their case. A series of psychologists then interviewed Puente in her cell for a protracted period. She had a rough upbringing and experienced a lack of affection and understanding, which in their opinion, contributed to her apparent levels of stress, which then impaired her judgment. In response, the defense presented evidence showing that Puente had always been rational throughout her life and made a strong case that Dorothea Puente was only driven by money. Judge O'Hanagan decided that Dorothea Puente would go on trial for nine charges of murder on June 19, 1990. After several months of delay, the trial opened to Judge Michael J. Verga, starting on February 9, 1993. The defense and prosecution restated their initial claims as they presented their respective cases. The trial stretched on for months, with one delay after another until eventually, on July 15, 1993, the jury retired to deliberate after hearing 3,500 pages of testimony from 153 witnesses and being further under pressure by the knowledge that the prosecution was pursuing the death sentence. The jury deliberated the evidence for days without hearing anything until, on the afternoon of August 2nd, a note was delivered to the judge. We, the jury, are evenly divided on all nine charges and need more instructions. Judge Verga's counsel was clear-cut and straightforward the next day after the defense successfully opposed a motion for a mistrial. He said, go back and try again. 
He then instructed them on how to make a choice and then dismissed them to continue thinking. The jury decided in the late afternoon on August 26th. The court clerk announced the verdicts in front of a full courtroom. Following the sentencing, additional discussions about Puente's future were held in the courtroom. On December 11th, 1993, Judge Verga imposed his punishment. The sentence for Dorothea Puente was to be life in jail without the chance of release. Surprisingly upbeat, Puente told her attorneys after learning the judgment didn't murder anyone. Puente was transported back to Sacramento after being charged with nine murders. She told reporters she hadn't murdered anybody as she was on her way back, saying, I used to be a wonderful person at one point. Puente was either presented as a kind grandma-like figure or as a cunning criminal who preyed on the helpless during the trial. She may have committed theft, but not murder, according to her attorneys. According to pathologists, testimony, none of the corpse's causes of death could be determined. The prosecutor, John O'Mara, summoned more than 130 witnesses to the witness stand. According to prosecutors, Puente drugged her tenants with sleeping medications, strangled them, and then paid inmates to bury the bodies in the yard. In all seven of the unearthed bodies, Dalmain, a sleeping pill, was discovered. Puente, according to the prosecution, was one of the coldest and most cunning female killers the nation has ever seen. Puente maintained her innocence and that the persons in her care were in excellent hands to the end of her life. Puente stated behind bars, the only time they were in excellent health was when they were at my home. I had them take a bath every day, change into clean clothing every day, and eat three meals a day. They weren't supposed to survive when they came to see me since they were so ill. Shane Bugby and Dorothea started corresponding in 1998, and over the next few years, they conducted extensive interviews. And he carried out intensive research to find out what was going on in her head. After she started giving him different recipes, the book, Cooking with a Serial Killer, was published in 2004. It contained a lengthy interview, about 50 different recipes, and different works of inmate art that the convicted killer had given to Bugby. At the age of 82, Dorothea Puente passed away in custody from natural causes on March 27, 2011. And so the tale of the killer grandma came to an end. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Dorothea Puente. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.